Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to start this video off discussing the 12900K as we actually have yet more benchmarks, but I really want to focus first of all on a benchmark which is showing the chip hit 5.2 gigahertz overclocked, but the power consumption well, let's just say you're probably not going to want to run this with a gigabyte power supply. So Enthusiastic Citizen has posted this on Billy Billy. I'll, of course, link the post in the description of this video. And all of the high performance cores are locked to 5.2 gigahertz. As far as I understand with the post here, I'm basically using it, um, Google Translate, excuse me, to English. But it seems like the small cores are not being utilized but the V-Core is set to 1.385 volts, and the power consumption is an eye-watering 330 watts. You see why a moment ago I said perhaps not to use this with a gigabyte power supply? Could you perhaps in the comments let me know how you feel it would go putting one of these with maybe an RTX 4090 in a small form factor case with, again, a gigabyte power supply? Hmm possibly wouldn't feel too comfortable with it myself. The performance results though, again, using CPU-Z, so metrics are kind of, well, skewed somewhat, but still 851 for single core score versus around 650 for the 5950X. Meanwhile, multi-thread is basically parity between Intel's 12900K and again, the 5950X. Of course, the usual caveats apply here. First of all, we don't know the state of, for example, the BIOS used on the 12900K, memory timings, all of that jazz. And of course, the 5950X itself, well, you can certainly do a lot to tweak the performance of that chip. It's very tweakable if you start messing around with things like memory timings, memory frequencies, and of course, you know, the voltage curves and all of that jazz. But we are not done with the 12900K. Oh, no, 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 no. We actually have yet more results, and this is um, actually perhaps even more impressive as we actually have them for Cinebench R23 and uh, CPU-Z again. So I'd like to give credit real quick to the chap known as Yuki ANS, though I got this information initially from HXL on Twitter, so I'll give credit to both of them, and of course I'll link both of their posts in the description. So Cinebench R23 has been tested with the 12900K, and we can see both a single thread and multi-thread result here. I'm going to compare it specifically, first of all, to the 11900K. So yeah, I mean, it's fairly impressive, both single thread and multi-thread as a gain, over the 11900K. You, I'm going to be rounding up and down here just for all of our sanities, but you're looking at just over a thousand points. Actually, it's close to 11,000 points higher again for Cinebench R23. Although, of course, the caveat here is that the configuration of the chip is very different to Rocket Lake. Meanwhile, the 5950X scores, again, I'm going to be rounding up here, uh, around 29,000 points. So we are looking at around a 1,500 point difference in multi-thread, but single core score is 2,000 versus around 1,600 of the 5950X. Now, my personal opinion of Alder Lake so far is that I do think it's going to be definitely having some significant wins and some significant losses against uh, AMD's upcoming processors. Uh, that, of course, would be Ryzen Vcash. We'll be getting into a Vcash story in just a moment. I'm going to be very interested to see how the state of software really affects this. We've been seeing a lot of stories, of course, of how Windows 11 is just all over the place, especially with Ryzen processors with like uh, cache latencies and goodness knows what else. And I suspect that Quite honestly, it's going to be really hit and miss. This is a prediction, and I'm saying this with a lot of ignorance because I've not tested Ryzen Vcash myself or the 12900K, but I do make a prediction that let's just say you had a review of both of them available day one. I predict that 12 months later or possibly even six months later, the results could be quite a bit different. It's going to be very interesting just to keep on top of that. 
Uh, but anyway, quick thing for CPU-Z because we've already kind of discussed CPU-Z with the overclocked form. But you can see again here that you're looking around 830 with these particular results for the 12900K and around 11,500 in multi-thread. And we've already discussed how well, of course, it compares against the 5950X previously, so I won't go over those numbers again. All I will say is that it is giving the uh, 11900K a nice spanking here. So uh, the 11900K Rocket Lake has a nice pink butt by the time the 12900K gets hold of it. Perhaps the thing though that's really interesting is actually a post from Grayman. Actually, it's a two-parter. And of course, the link here is um, Twitter account in the description. So Grayman55 has said that the Zen 3 V cache will enter mass production in November. But that Zen 3 V2, we'll get what that means in just a moment, has been shipped and starting availability at the end of December. Now, I am pretty damn positive. I've now been told this by a couple of different sources, including one who is, let's just say, very certain to be right, that AMD had initially wanted to hit the Vcache processors this year. But just because of well, let's just say the state of things, things had been delayed. Now, this is not anything to do really with the response to older lake or anything like that. It's just supply chains, you know, things take time to actually enter production. And obviously, Zen 3 initially, it did have the through silicon vias, right? This was one of the things that we just didn't notice about Zen 3. And it just wasn't present in previous chips. So you can, you can look at the... Um, you know, the, 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 the die shots yourself, and you can quite clearly see that Zen 3 had it, and somehow people just missed it, including myself, so I'm not holding anyone accountable. It just was one of those things, because you weren't looking for it, so your eyes just kind of not, not you know, just it just didn't see it, simple as that. But Zen 2 and previous chimps did not have this. So obviously, in this respect, AMD were kind of planning for the future. And we've already had Robert Halleck, of course, discuss their plans for this and the performance targets of Vcash. And I honestly think it's going to be really good. It will, of course, be on the AM4 socket. But I do suspect, although Robert himself did not confirm this, that we will see products kind of filter down to the Ryzen platform in the future. And again, this is speculative. I think it's pretty likely that we're going to see these products eventually come to things like Thread Ripper. I feel that this is kind of like a test for AMD, that they're, they're basically testing out the technology. And it makes sense when you think about it from a logical point of view, right? You, you test the product and then you use it on an established process, an established process which actually has an established architecture tied with it when the process itself has matured and obviously you get better yields it just makes sense to do all of this stuff, at least to me. So I'm going to be really curious to see how all of the how all of this kind of plays out. Now, the other thing too is that, um, and this is perhaps the most important, and it again kind of matches up to what I've been hearing. The Vcache processors, as well as B2, again we'll get into what B2 is in just a moment, I promise. But they apparently do not have any clock frequency improvements. I had been told possibly very modest. I was told maybe, maybe 100 megahertz, 200 at the absolute max, but likely 100 at the, at, you know, at outside chance. But this just doesn't look like it's happening. And honestly, I'm not really surprised because this is not being manufactured on, you know, in a new node or anything like that. And obviously, power consumption and other things are, uh, well, a thing. So I'm not really surprised. As for B2, basically it doesn't necessarily mean there are any improvements. This is not like, you know, a new revision, like, for example, we saw from Zen to Zen Plus, right? You're not seeing uh, improvements in cache or cache timings or larger cache or improvements to the actual fundamental architecture. These could be small bug fixes in the silicon, perhaps, like, for example, to do with security, they're patched in hardware. Or maybe it could just be other small refinements to the manufacturing of the chip. And this, again, is not something that's new. We've seen Intel do this. We've seen AMD do this like a billion times before. And sometimes, just sometimes, 
you know when you get new steppings or whatever it can mean that you get slightly better overclocks or maybe slightly lower voltage uh, i think it was was it the was it the Q6600 that everyone wanted, like a specific setting, uh, stepping, not setting, specific uh, stepping? I can't remember what that bloody stepping was now. It's going to bug the crap out of me. I'm going to Google it after this video. But yeah, there was like a stepping for the uh, Q66. Yeah, it was the Q6600. I'm almost positive, but I can't remember what the stepping was. Anyway, I'm getting, I'm digressing like way too much here. But yeah, I'm quite interested in both of these things. Speaking of things that are interesting though, uh, Sony have continued to do their strategy that they've basically stated in public and released yet more titles to PC. And now we have God of War, which is well, confirmed to be released in January. As of the time I'm recording this, there are currently no system specifications listed on Steam, but it's going to cost you around 40 Great British Pounds, or your regional equivalent. There are graphical improvements, including things like screen space, ambient occlusion, better shadows, you've got better textures, uh, unlock frame rate, you've got, of course, support for ultra-wide, which I know is going to make many of you smile, because, well, it's a thing, of course. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be hardware ray tracing baked in, which I do feel a little bit disappointed in. Honestly, it does also support, of all things, NVIDIA Reflex, as well as NVIDIA DLSS. A lot of folks are actually surprised about the DLSS thing. Um, I'm being told that a lot of Sony games actually might be supporting DLSS. I'm not 100% certain on that, so I'm certainly not going to you know, bank on it. But I've heard a few whispers that Sony are looking to test out DLSS technology um, rather than FSR. I'm not 100% what the reasoning is for DLSS. I mean, you can start doing some speculation. Perhaps the studios want to start messing around with perhaps more advanced machine learning stuff or whatever. I'm not really sure. However, remember, while Sony does have a great relationship with AMD, and this is not like, you know, to say NVIDIA are going to be using um, their technology in, let's say, the PS5 Pro or the PlayStation 6 or anything like that. Sony does have a great relationship with AMD, but it is imperative to remember that Sony does give a lot of freedom to its developers, much like Microsoft does to its developers. So at the end of the day, this would have probably been a studio's decision. I'll be very interested to try out God of War. I played it maybe about three or four hours, I think, on the PS4 Pro, but the lower frame rate kind of bugged me, like uh, 30 FPS I, I didn't really, you know, I didn't really care for. So I was kind of waiting for it to either be released on PC or the PlayStation 5 update, and well, I figure at this point I'll just play it on PC. So interested to test this one out. With that said, thank you very much for, well, checking out this video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day.